As interest and discussion has increased on the subject of getting out of the cities, many are asking, is it really time to leave now? We hear conflicting voices. Some assure us that there's no need to be alarmed. Yet in the evening news, we hear of entire cities being swept away, and somewhere in the back recesses of our Adventist minds, that rings a bell. Some say the sign to leave the cities has already come. Others confidently state that there's no need to worry just now, for the sign will yet be in the future when the Sunday law is passed. How can we know the answer to this question? There's only one way. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Is it really time now? God sent us these warnings approximately 100 years ago. The Protestant world have set up an idle Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be, and they are treading in the footsteps of the papacy. For this reason I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities into retired country places where they may cultivate the land and raise their own produce. As God's commandment-keeping people, we must leave the cities. As did Enoch, we must work in the cities, but not dwell in them. Said the messenger of God, Shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. Leave the cities, and like Enoch, come from your retirement to warn the people of the cities. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. Now listen to this statement. Let children no longer be exposed to the temptations of the cities that are ripe for destruction. The Lord has sent us warning and counsel to get out of the cities. Then let us make no more investments in the cities. Fathers and mothers, how do you regard the souls of your children? Are you preparing the members of your families for translation into the heavenly courts? Are you preparing them to become members of the royal family? children of the heavenly king? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? How will ease, comfort, convenience compare with the value of the souls of your children? Out of the cities, out of the cities, this is the message the Lord has been giving me. The earthquakes will come, the floods will come, and we are not to establish ourselves in the wicked cities where the enemy is served in every way and where God is so often forgotten. The instruction is still being given, move out of the cities. Who will be warned? We say again, out of the cities. Based on these quotations, it should be quite obvious that it has been time to leave the cities for more than a hundred years. Is this council really for everyone? Some point to Mrs. White's use of qualifying phrases, such as, as fast as possible, and whenever possible, to suggest that everyone does not need to heed the counsel to get out of the cities. A careful and thorough consideration of these statements actually reveals a view that is in harmony with the mountain of counsel that all of God's people need to move out of the cities. Notice these statements. Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. Whenever possible, it is the duty of parents to make homes in the country for their children. The children and youth should be carefully guarded. They should be kept away from the hotbeds of iniquity that are to be found in our cities. Now consider these statements in light of the following quotation. The time has come when as God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. Notice that this constitutes a warning against rash moves. We must move wisely and carefully in the providence of God 
relying implicitly upon his guidance. Consider also the following statement, which sheds yet more light on all of this. For years we have been instructed that our brethren and sisters, and especially families with children, should plan to leave the cities as the way opens before them to do so. Many will have to labor earnestly to help open the way. Here we see that God must open the way, and yet the only way that we'll know if it is possible is if we're actually exerting efforts along those lines. In fact, how can we expect to know we're moving as fast as possible unless we're earnestly seeking to find the way out of the city? These statements deal with how we are to move forward, not whether or not we all need to heed God's warnings. Has the sign come or not? Let's take a look at a remarkable statement which explains the sign for God's people to leave the cities. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Some declare that on the basis of this statement it will not be time to leave the cities until the Sunday law is actually passed. How can this be? We've already read the clear counsel, much of it written with an obvious sense of urgency to leave the cities. Now we're told that it won't actually be time to do that until the Sunday law is passed? Could Mrs. White have given such contradictory counsel? Is there another way of looking at this that would be consistent with all of her other counsel? It has always been the practice of Seventh-day Adventists to compare Scripture with Scripture and build our positions by harmonizing all of the Word of the Lord. We do not build our theology on a single statement, especially at the expense of a great weight of scriptural evidence to the contrary. We must follow this same principle if we would understand the signal to leave the cities. Notice first what we were commanded to do when the sign should come. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Notice here a step progression. First, leaving the large cities and moving to the smaller ones. Finally, there would be a move from the smaller cities to more secluded rural homes. We've already seen that Mrs. White gave a clear call to come out of the cities in her day. Now notice this statement, which brings this into even sharper focus. Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. That should grab our attention because the first step was to leave the large cities. The only obvious conclusion would be that if we are to take that first step, then the sign must have come. Also, note that this signal to leave the cities in the last days was drawn from a parallel in history, namely the siege by Rome around the city of Jerusalem. Here's how Mrs. White describes it in the book Great Controversy. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. This siege was led by the Roman general Cestius. The followers of Christ inside Jerusalem recognized it as the sign to leave the city, but they could not leave due to the siege. Then one day, for no apparent reason, the Roman armies retreated, giving the Christians an opportunity to leave, which they did. Several years later, the Roman armies returned under the leadership of Titus. Eventually, they took the city and destroyed the temple. Thus, there were two sieges, the first being the sign to leave the city. Has the parallel event taken place in modern times? Let's look again at the description of that first siege under Cestius found in the book Great Controversy, noticing the language used. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. Now carefully consider the following quotation. The Protestant world have set up an idle Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be, and they are treading in the footsteps of the papacy. 
For this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities into retired country places. Notice the almost identical language between these two statements. The only movement in our nation with reference to a Sunday law was the Blair Bill of 1888. This was the first ever attempt to pass a federal Sunday law. Prior to this, there had been state Sunday laws, but this bill, if passed into law, would make Sunday the legal day of worship in all federal territories. Due in part to the efforts of A.T. Jones in hearings before a congressional committee, the Blair Bill was not passed into law. Over time, the issue seemed to subside. Some will respond, but the Sunday law wasn't passed. That's right, just like the first siege did not desolate the city. Truly a remarkable parallel. But could this really be an assumption of power if the law was not passed? Let's allow Mrs. White to define the term assumption of power. She uses the phrase again in Signs of the Times, November 22, 1899. But there must be no assumption of power on the part of God's chosen people. Those who take their orders from Christ must not seek to compel others to obey the law of Jehovah. Notice that even merely seeking to compel others constitutes an assumption of power. But what about the word enforcing? Doesn't that mean the law must be passed? No. According to Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary, to enforce can simply mean to urge with energy. By the way, we now hear the rumble of the return of the Roman armies. The unabridged catechism of the Catholic Church, the 1994 edition, calls for Sunday legislation. The Lord's Day Alliance is alive and well and announced just after 9-11 that we have entered a time of special opportunity to promote Sunday. Incidentally, the Lord's Day Alliance was a major backer of the Blair Bill in 1888. Their official letterhead has the words, serving the churches and the nation since 1888. Didn't Ellen White say that some should move into the cities to evangelize them? Some quote a couple of statements in which Mrs. White encourages families to move to cities to engage in missionary work. Once again, they seek to use these quotes to disregard the many other statements, making clear our duty to get out of the cities. But upon careful examination and taking all of the counsel of the spirit of prophecy into account, we find there is perfect harmony. We see the great need of missionary work to carry the truth, not only to foreign countries, but to those who are near us. Close around us are cities and towns in which no efforts are made to save souls. Why should not families who know the present truth settle in these cities and villages to set up there the standard of Christ, working in humility, not in their own way, but in God's way, to bring the light before those who have no knowledge of it? It is not the purpose of God that his people should colonize or settle together in large communities. The disciples of Christ are his representatives upon the earth. And God designs that they shall be scattered all over the country, in the towns, cities, and villages, as lights amidst the darkness of the world. They are to be missionaries for God, by their faith and works, testifying to the near approach of the coming Savior. Keep in mind that God's people were explicitly instructed to leave the large cities first, moving to smaller ones. This was confirmed in 1900, when Mrs. White wrote, Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. It would then be in accordance with her counsel to live in smaller cities at that time. The view that would harmonize all the counsel on the subject would be that she must have been referring to the smaller cities. To suggest another interpretation would be to suggest a glaring contradiction. Notice that the language in both of these quotes places these cities in the context of towns and villages we read cities and towns, cities and villages, and towns, cities, and villages. What about those who say we shouldn't try to protect ourselves from the coming judgments of God? The spirit of prophecy makes it clear that one of the reasons God's people are to leave the cities is to avoid the judgments of God that will fall on them. Notice the following statements. 
The Lord calls for his people to locate away from the cities. For in such an hour as ye think not, fire and brimstone will be rained from heaven upon these cities. Proportionate to their sins will be their visitation. Out of the cities, out of the cities, this is the message the Lord has been giving me. The earthquakes will come, the floods will come, and we are not to establish ourselves in the wicked cities. The story of Lot serves as a good example of this. Surely God could have saved Lot and his family while they remained in the city. What an amazing story that would have been. Lot, along with his wife and daughters, standing amidst the sizzling ruins of Sodom. But that wasn't God's method. He told Lot to leave. Regarding this incident, the pen of inspiration says, Again the solemn command was given to hasten, for the fiery storm would be delayed but little longer. But one of the fugitives ventured to cast a look backward to the doomed city, and she became a monument of God's judgment. If Lot himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning, but had earnestly fled toward the mountains without one word of pleading or remonstrance, his wife also would have made her escape. The influence of his example would have saved her from the sin that sealed her doom. But his hesitancy and delay caused her to lightly regard the divine warning. While her body was upon the plain, her heart clung to Sodom, and she perished with it. What about the lost in the cities? Many suggest that the Christian thing to do is to come close to the lost living in the cities. They tell us that this can be done much better by God's people living in the midst of these metropolitan centers rather than outside of them. They suggest that we should be willing to sacrifice ourselves for the cause of saving the lost in these cities. But the Lord told us long ago, to obey is better than sacrifice. However, the call to leave the cities is not a call to forget the lost there. On the contrary, we're counseled to make special plans to warn those living in the great centers of population. We must make wise plans to warn the cities and at the same time live where we can shield our children and ourselves from the contaminating and demoralizing influences so prevalent in these places. The cities are to be worked from outposts. Said the messenger of God, shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. As God's commandment-keeping people, we must leave the cities. As did Enoch, we must work in the cities, but not dwell in them. Didn't Ellen White indicate some of God's people would remain in the cities up to the very end? In the book Great Controversy, we read of the time of the death decree, when God's people will flee from the cities and villages. Also in the book Last Day Events, the following title appears on page 121. Some righteous still in the cities after the death decree has been passed. Interestingly, this quotation immediately follows. In the time of trouble, we all fled from the cities and villages, but were pursued by the wicked who entered the houses of the saints with a sword. Notice that the houses of these righteous individuals are outside the cities, not in them. What were they doing in the city if their homes were without? As we noted previously, the cities are to be worked from outposts. Said the messenger of God, shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. What are they doing in the cities? There's only one answer to that question. They must be ministering to the lost that are there. How far out of the cities should we be? Some who live in quieter neighborhoods within the city limits believe they're in the country. Others feel the suburbs qualify. Ellen White said, let men of sound judgment be appointed, not to publish abroad their intentions, but to search for such properties in the rural districts in easy access to the cities, suitable for small training schools for workers, and where facilities may also be provided for treating the sick and weary souls who know not the truth. 
Look for such places just out from the large cities, where suitable buildings may be secured, either as a gift from the owners or purchased at a reasonable price by the gifts of our people. Do not erect buildings in the noisy cities. Notice she used the phrases in easy access to the cities and just out from the large cities. So what did she mean by these phrases? To seek an answer to this question, I decided to consider some of the places that God gave special indication we were to obtain for the establishing of schools. There is a simple principle involved here. They should be close enough to centers of population to provide opportunity for the students to minister to the people, yet not so close as to make it too convenient to be exposed to the temptations of the city. These places were typically in the neighborhood of 8 to 10 miles from the nearest city or town. But here's the interesting point. The common mode of travel then was horse and buggy. If the roads were good, that meant a travel speed of about 6 to 7 miles per hour. In other words, these places were often 1 to 2 hours out, and that was considered just out from the cities. Some would say, do you really think that God expects us to be that far away from the cities today? Keep in mind that God would have us move farther out as time goes on. Remember the statement, leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. You can see there a step progression. God has made provision for this progression with the advent of the automobile. So is there one rule that fits everyone? No. God's step for one may not be exactly the same as for another. The main point here is not to rationalize your way out of the conviction that God wants you to move if you're in the city. He will show you how far away that needs to be. We've seen that God's people have had more than 100 years to respond to the warning. But time is running out. And it is now imperative that we take swift action to follow the instructions before it is too late. But you might be thinking, where do I start? What should I do next? Many have become so entangled in the systems of this world that such a radical shift might seem overwhelming. Jesus said, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Remember, God is the one asking us to do this. So he must have a way for each person to follow his instructions. In fact, there are six steps we need to follow to be sure we're moving forward in God's way. I spoke on this subject recently at our Out of the Cities rally in Chicago. Let's go now to the live recording of that meeting as we consider the subject, taking the next step. It's been amazing to see what the Lord has done just in recent months for people as they've stepped out in faith to follow the Lord's plan. Now, I want to address a few things because we're going to talk about six essential steps that you need to take. And how many of you want to do this thing? All right. And I know there's some here, you already live out of the city. You're in the country. And uh, it's good to be reinforced, isn't it? You can also be an encouragement to others. So I'm going to give you the six. It's not going to take long. Six essential steps. Step number one. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You need to study this out for yourself. You've heard things, and I think, how many of you believe it's time to get out of the city? Of course. But friends, I'm telling you, opposition is headed your way. Now, I don't want to discourage you, but we've got to be realistic. And you're going to get opposition from some of the most unlikely places. Unfortunately, it's going to come from people you love and respect. And that's why there's no substitute for studying this out for yourself. Personally, I hope that you've questioned some of the things we've told you enough today that you will go and check it out for yourself. And I would challenge you to do so. Prove it wrong, friend. You need to have a basis on whereon you stand. And it needs to be founded in Scripture and the spirit of prophecy. And that basis is there. Now... One of the first things that you're going to hear people say is, it's not really yet time. This is premature. The sign is not yet come. Now, let me just cut to the chase, all right? But you've got to study this out for yourself. But I want you to think about this. 
If the sign has not yet come, then Mrs. White would be a false prophet. It's very quiet in here. I don't believe she's a false prophet. But why do I say that? Because it was Mrs. White who said, when the sign comes, here's what you are to do. What did she say? First step, leave the large cities. In 1900, you've got her saying, get out of the large cities as fast as possible. You see, if the sign hasn't come, then why were we instructed to begin taking those steps? There are plenty of remarkable statements, and I would encourage you to read them. I've heard people say, well, there's just a few statements taken out of context. No, no. Friend, there is a mountain of evidence on this point. Many, many statements. As God's commandment keeping people, we must leave the cities. As did Enoch, we must work in the cities but not dwell in them. Then we're going to come back to that in just a moment. Here is Manuscript Release, Volume 1, page 250. Leave the cities and like Enoch, come from your retirement to warn the people of the cities. Listen to this. This is Evangelism, page 79. Enoch walked with God and yet he did not live in the midst of any city. How do you like that? Now, I've heard people say, well, but Mrs. White indicated that there would be people in the cities at the time of the death decree. Have you heard this? Yes. We need to read the whole story. We need to read it all. And we find out something remarkable. Listen to this. This is Early Writings, page 34. In the time of trouble... We all fled from the cities and villages. You say, wow, the time of trouble, what were they doing there? Listen to this. We all fled from the cities and villages, but were pursued by the wicked who entered the houses of the saints with the sword. Where were the houses? Did you catch it? The houses were out of the cities. They were chased out of the cities to their homes. That's the rest of the story. And you say, well, it doesn't sound very good. They were chased with swords and the swords were lifted. And this is, we've got to keep reading. They raised the sword to kill us, but it broke and fell as powerless as straw. Nothing to worry about, friends, when you're following the Lord's plan. By the way, what were they doing in these cities? Obviously, they weren't living there. Their homes weren't there. There's only one thing that makes sense to me they're doing there. They're taking a warning message to the people who live in those cities. You know, I read a few minutes ago, as did Enoch, we must work in the cities but not dwell in them. That's not talking about your occupation. That's talking about working for the master. That's talking about soul winning. Let me read to you a few more statements. This is Manuscript Release, Volume 1, page 253. Said the messenger of God, shall not the cities be warned? By the way, this is another point of opposition. I hear it all around me, sometimes in some of our magazines. I hear it said, it's not like Jesus to leave the cities. Jesus came close to the people. Have you heard this? Those who leave the cities were accused of abandoning the lost in the cities. You know, since I left the city, I've visited more cities in America than I'd been in in my whole life before that. The Lord opens opportunities for us. He'll open opportunities for you too. But listen to this. Said the messenger of God, shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them. Is that clear? There's no question. But by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. That's what we're to be doing. That's the work we have is to warn the people in the cities of what's coming. By the way, this was a quotation. Mrs. White said, said the messenger of God. An angel told her. Is that good enough for you? It's good enough for me. Listen, this is another interesting one. Evangelism, page 79. When iniquity abounds in a nation, there's always to be heard some voice giving warning and instruction as the voice of Lot was heard in Sodom. Yet, all that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them even if they had lived in a place some distance away from the city. All right, so we need to study these things out and bolster yourself, friends, and don't listen to the voice or the voices that will come to discourage you. Step number two, pray for God's guidance. You can just jot this text down, Luke chapter 18, verse 1. The important widow who came perseveringly in prayer. Now, I'm not talking about praying to know whether or not you ought to do God's will, right? Have you ever heard people say this? Yes, I can see the Sabbath. In evangelism, we see this sometimes. I can see that the Sabbath is, that's, it's biblical, and now I'm going to go home and I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will convict me. Have you ever heard someone say this? 
Friends, that's presumptuous. If you already see that it's truth from the Word of God, we don't need to pray to know if it's truth again. We need to pray that the Lord will help us to do it and to do it in His strength. Step number three, make a start. Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 11, tells the story of ten lepers. Do you remember it? It's an amazing story. It has a powerful principle packed there. These ten lepers, oh, they wanted to be made whole, and they heard about Jesus. They heard that he could heal them, so they came to Jesus, and what did Jesus do? This was one of those unique situations. It wasn't just an instant healing right there. He asked them to do something first, didn't he? What did he say? Go show yourselves to the priests. Now, the only reason to show yourself to the priest is if you've been healed. Only the priest could declare a leper clean and ready for society again. But Jesus told them to go before they were healed. What would you have done? Let me ask it differently. What would have happened if they all just sat down and said, well, as soon as we're healed, we'll go? Read it there in Luke 17. It says, as they went, they were cleansed. Friends, you've got to make a start. You've got to make a start. And when can you start? Well, you can start today with many of the things you've learned, and you can start tomorrow. Begin searching. Where, Lord, do you want me to go? Praying, asking him to help you. Begin considering some other things. You might need to make a change in occupation. That's a possibility. And I believe that the Lord has provided opportunities now for God's people to do certain things from almost anywhere. I meet lots of people that work in the computer field. You know, nowadays you can work in the computer field from almost anywhere. And I have friends. I've seen remarkable miracles open before them. They were able to move far away from the company they work for because they do it all electronically. All right. You may not have to seek a new occupation. But now, in, in considering that, friends, let me say something else. If you need to be re-educated to get a new occupation, I believe you need to search for something that you can be trained in quickly. Quickly. Not a long training process. And I believe the Lord has plenty of opportunities. And we can maybe talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, or I'll be happy to stay by and talk to people after the meeting. But the point is, step number three, make a start. I remember a man who told the story. He wanted to move out of the city, and he put a for sale sign up. By the way, some people have said this. Well, when someone comes up to my door and says, I want to buy your house, then I'll know it's time to leave. No, no, friends. The Lord is trying to prepare us to take initiative on his word. Our faith is to be in his word, not the actions of other people, right? Perhaps you need to put a for sale sign up. Well, this man did it. He put a for sale sign up, and nothing happened, and months went by. But during those months, he was feeling convicted. He was in a bad situation in his job, and he needed to change his job, and he knew it. But he didn't do anything about it. Month after month went by and his house wasn't selling and he thought, Lord, if you just sell my house, I'll have to move and I'll have to get another job. And finally he did what he knew he must do. <clears throat> he sought a change in employment. He got a new job. And as I remember, just within days of the new job, he sold that house. Friends, we must make a start. Here's what Mrs. White said. This is letter 25, 1902. All that needs to be done cannot be specified till a beginning is made. You've got to make a start. Step four. Very important. Don't rationalize. I was thinking about scriptural examples of this. Can you imagine the rationalization for Adam there in the garden? Oh, God is too loving. He won't do it. No, he wouldn't do it. No punishment. Just a, just a piece of fruit. Boy, it kind of goes the way of our thinking so easily to rationalize, isn't it? And how do we rationalize on this issue? Well, it's not really that big a city. In fact, go back and read the story of Lot. He begged with the Lord, can I just go to this city? It's but a little city, Zoar. Just a little one, Lord. Just a little bit. That's rationalization. Sometimes people say, well, actually, I'm not really living in the city. I'm, I'm in the suburbs. In fact... I'll tell you, one of the great disappointments in my ministry was when I started to preach this message, I was pastoring a city church, and that Sabbath, I'll never forget it, a lady who was living in Reno, Nevada, came to me after the message, and she said, Pastor, praise God for that message. I'm so glad I don't live in the city. And I was stunned. I told my wife, I failed. person living in Reno, Nevada, Reno Sparks are merged together. The combined population is about 200,000. 
And I told you this morning, L.A. was less than 100,000 when the heat was cranking up and Mrs. White was saying, out of the cities, out of the cities. So don't rationalize. By the way, <clears throat> some people say, well, how far is far enough? It's a good question. And I did a little study. I began to search in the spirit of prophecy on places that the Lord specified, this is where I want a school. Now I know everybody here, maybe somebody's going to raise up a school. Praise the Lord. But this, is, this was just for purposes for me to get an idea because our schools aren't supposed to be in the city. Our colleges aren't supposed to be in the city. And so where did the, were the places the Lord picked? And I found a pattern. Almost always, they were about 8 to 10 miles out of the nearest town. You say, well, that's pretty close. But you've got to remember something. This is horse and buggy days. And I was wondering, could I find out how long it would take to get 8 to 10 miles in a horse and buggy without using the encyclopedia from inspiration? So I punched in miles and hours on the CD-ROM, and I found a number of cases where it was recorded how long it took Mrs. White to get from point A to point B to one of our campuses to the nearest town. In fact, one example, Pacific Union College, Angwin, California. Any of you been there? All right. Down at the bottom of the mountain is Elmshaven, where Mrs. White lived. She records a trip she took, about two hours it took her to get from her home to Pacific Union College uh, with a horse, horse and buggy. And you say, two hours? You see, the, the Lord is so good. He has provided modes of transportation now for us to be further out. But there's a principle involved, a principle we get from the spirit of prophecy, to be close enough to the city so that you can visit the city to minister to the lost. I don't want anybody to leave today saying we're talking about becoming hermits and abandoning the lost in the city. Th this is why we're here today, friend. This is why I praised the Lord last night when I heard the train go by. Because we're visiting the city to warn people of what's coming. Close enough to visit the cities, but far enough that it's inconvenient so you won't be making lots of trips there unnecessarily. All right? Good principle to follow, don't you think? So don't rationalize. Step five, don't move rashly. 1 Corinthians 14, 40, the Apostle Paul said, Let all things be done decently and in order. Don't move rashly. There's one other thing I don't want people to walk out here to say tonight, and that's that we're recommending that people just do stupid things and sell their property at a loss and go invest in a business you don't know anything about. I'm not recommending that. I will say this, though. What needs to be done needs to be done quickly. But you need to ask the Lord to help you. And friends, we've got to do it in his strength and in his way. Remember, the people in the city of Jerusalem could not leave until God opened the way. But they were watching and they were looking. Had they not been seeking the way, they would have missed the opportunity as well. You say, well, it was about three and a half years. Yeah, what would have happened over that time? Hey, the crisis must be passed. Things are okay now. So don't move rashly, although we must move quickly. Move wisely. Move carefully. Plan. Ask the Lord to guide you. Ask Him to help you to find that employment. You need to have an idea what the Lord wants you to do when you go. Now, that doesn't mean all the questions will be answered. Remember, one of the steps we read a moment ago is you must first make a start. You heard some testimony just a moment ago about uh, someone who didn't see all the pieces coming together until they made that start. For us, I didn't know how it was going to work, but I knew what the Lord wanted us to do when we made our move. Step number six, move forward as God opens the way. There's a wonderful story, Exodus chapter 14. You know it well. The children of Israel had left Egypt. But no sooner, they didn't get very far on the trip, and they found themselves in a pinch. They were following the pillar of cloud and by day and the pillar of fire by night, right? Who was in that pillar? Jesus. And as they were following Jesus, Jesus could have taken them another way, but he took them the way they needed to go. And it was right into a pinch. They had the cliffs on one side, the rocky, steep mountains on one side, leading right up to the shore of the Red Sea. And pressing in behind them now were the Egyptian soldiers at the orders of Pharaoh coming after them. And things got stressful. You remember that? What I like is in verse 15. There's something I had missed in this story. I grew up in the church. I went to Sabbath school. I heard this story time and time again, but I missed something. And that is that they had some instructions. Two words. Go forward. Go forward. I like to imagine the analytical folk in the crowd. 
No, I'm not trying to pick on you if you're an engineer, but you know, I was thinking of the engineers. Looking at the Red Sea and the instructions are go forward, what are they saying? This is not a good plan. You think they were in the front of the line? I don't think so. But there were some people who decided to trust the Lord and they started walking. And they started walking right to the Red Sea. And God parted the Red Sea before them. By the way, can you hear the engineers now? This is a good plan. I have a question for you. Those theoretical, this group, the mixed multitude, I'm imagining what they would say. Bad plan? Oh, it worked. Good plan. Did they obey? I know it's a hypothetical situation. We don't find it described that way, but I'm just saying it describes people today. They won't go on the Word of God. But then when things seem to come together, well, now they're ready to get on board. Is that obedience? I found something startling in the book Patriarchs and Prophets. The people were weary and terrified. Yet if they had held back when Moses bade them advance, God would never have opened the path before them. It was by faith that they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. In marching down to the very water, they showed that they believed the word of God as spoken by Moses. They did all that was in their power to do. And then the mighty one of Israel divided the sea to make a path for their feet. The great lesson here taught is for all time. Often the Christian life is beset by dangers and duty seems hard to perform. The imagination pictures impending ruin before and bondage or death behind, yet the voice of God speaks clearly, go forward. We should obey this command even though our eyes cannot penetrate the darkness and we feel the cold waves about our feet. The obstacles that hinder our progress will never disappear before a halting, doubting spirit. Here it is. Please catch this. Those who defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat will never obey at all. I better read that again. Those who defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat will never obey at all. Unbelief whispers, let us wait till the obstructions are removed and we can see our way clearly. But faith courageously urges in advance, hoping all things, believing all things. The path where God leads the way may lie through the desert of the sea, but it is a safe path. Amen. Oh, I want to have prayer with you. Those are the six steps. My heart goes out to you. Some of you are going to be facing some of the greatest challenges of your life, but I want to encourage you that as you trust God and go forward, you're going to see the most remarkable miracles. I can honestly testify, as I know all the others who have had this experience as well with me, I can testify to you, the last four years of my life have been the most exciting. There have been some of the greatest challenges I've ever faced, but God has come through in such remarkable ways. I praise Him tonight. It strengthened my faith, and it'll strengthen yours too. So I'm going to do something different here as we close. Those of you I'm going to ask specifically for you city dwellers and your heart is burning tonight with a desire to obey the Lord and you don't know how it's all going to work out but you want to do it. I want to invite you to come down to the front and just move right in close here and we're going to have a season of prayer for you. What do you say? And then the others, if you want to come and join us too, but let, let those who are in the city who are so earnestly desirous of getting to that Enoch walk, that Enoch home, let them press down here to the front. This issue of getting out of the cities was so urgent to Mrs. White that she actually lost sleep over it. Notice these words penned in 1900. I could not sleep past two o'clock this morning. During the night season, I was in council. I was pleading with some families to avail themselves of God's appointed means and get away from the cities to save their children. Some were loitering, making no determined efforts. The angels of mercy hurried Lot and his wife and daughters by taking hold of their hands. Had Lot hastened as the Lord desired him to, his wife would not have become a pillar of salt. Lot had too much of a lingering spirit. Let us not be like him. 
the same voice that warned Lot to leave Sodom bids us come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean. Those who obey this warning will find a refuge. Let every man be wide awake for himself and try to save his family. Let him gird himself for the work. God will reveal from point to point what to do next. The Lord Jesus has a place in the country for you, my friend. His death on Calvary purchased every blessing, including this one. Remember this promise from Medical Ministry, page 310. God will help his people to find such homes outside the cities. Thank you for joining us for this presentation, and may God bless you.